You all know why you're here. Diaphragm deflection. Oh. And we have a special guest apparently. Oh, look at that guy. Are you excited for diaphragm deflection, Cal? Well, I was gonna say like and subscribe, but don't do it for me. Do it for our boy Atlas in the back. And uh, we're gonna be diving into the ASCE 716. We're gonna be diving into the NDS, special design provisions for wind and seismic. Get excited, let's get going. So we've gone through a couple of different phases of this uh, tilt up construction. We went redundancy factor, we designed our diaphragm, we specified all that nailing for the diaphragm, then we got into cord design, knocked all that out. You know, we have rebar within our walls to act as our cords. But now we find ourselves uh, with this next question. We're getting into deflection. For the tilt up concrete building shown above, the total, uh, determine the total inelastic deflection of the diaphragm. Well, since we have a wood diaphragm, we're gonna have to hop over to the NDS special design provisions for wind and seismic. And let's go thumb through some pages to figure out where the equation lies to determine your deflection of your diaphragm. See you over there. That lands us in section 4.2, wood frame diaphragms. You know you're in the right spot then. And then one of the first sections is deflection. And then if we scooch right up here, boom, we're given this big beefy equation. Don't let it panic you too much here because right below it, they do a great job of giving you all of your definitions for all of your variables. So although there's a lot, we're gonna walk through them all obviously. You know why you're here and uh, we're gonna get everything plugged in and we're gonna find that deflection. So here's the three main pieces of meat of this equation. And before I go further, I wanna break down what each of these pieces of the equation mean in terms of deflection. This first section you can think of as deflection due to bending of your diaphragm. Then you have the next section, which is deflection due to shear. And then lastly, you have deflection due to cord slip. And because really it's a, it's a combination of all these different areas of your building where you can slowly start to get deformation and movement, um, which ultimately stack up to create your total deflection of your structure, in this case, of our diaphragm. Okay, I've now transferred over the definitions to the variables. We have A for area of cord cross section in inches squared. W is the diaphragm width, depending on the direction that you're analyzing. Uh, e is the elastic modulus of the cord. G sub A is the diaphragm shear stiffness, and this is uh, due to nail slip and also panel shear deformation. That's in kips per inch. Uh, the modulus was in PSI, width was in feet. I have them right on the side here for all the units that we're gonna be using. L is your diaphragm length in feet. Again, depending on the direction that you're looking at and you're calculating. Um, this, I'm gonna call it squiggly V. I don't know Greek. And uh, that is the max unit shear at strength level forces um, in the direction, again, that you're analyzing. And uh, then you have summation of uh, delta sub C times X. And that's the sum of individual cord slip values um, on both sides of the diaphragm and then multiplied by the distance of each one of those uh, values to the nearest support. Then a little bit further down, I know a lot of writing, not a lot of numbers, and you're like, I'm about to click off this channel right now. Just chill for a second. Um, some assumptions in the calculations for today's example are that the diaphragm is simply supported, diaphragm is uniformly nailed, diaphragm is completely blocked, um, the depth and widths are consistent of the diaphragm, so there's not a change in its geometry, and there's no significant openings uh, within the diaphragm as well. And lastly, that the diaphragm is uniformly loaded, so it doesn't have some weird, different type of loading along its storyline. It's all consistent, which we have all of those today. Um, our building is very regular, um, so this is great. This is a simple yet in-depth example. So let's start solving this thing. Let's bring in the numbers, let's scooch out the letters, and let's do what we like to do. Let's start with bending deflection. I've grabbed our loading schematic from above that we solved previously in other videos and uh, brought it, a copy of it down below here. And the values for shear, we need to remember, are ASD. So they are service level forces, but for these equations, we need to change that service level and go to strength level. So um, since we were doing a design for earthquake, which for ASD, the load combo is simplistically 0.7 EH, and for LRFD, it's 1.0 EH. So to go from ASD to LRFD, you can divide by 0.7 
and that will bump you back to strength level design criteria. So that's what we need to do. So let's get that done. 738. 738. Great, we've actually solved our first variable. That is our unit shear that we'll be needing in our calculations. But I'll, I'll rewrite that further down when it gets time to, to get there. But first we need the area A of our cord, which uh, we determined in previous videos is uh, two number seven pieces of rebar. So area equals two number sevens. A number seven is 0 0.6 inches squared per bar, which gets us 1.2 inches squared. That's A. E, let's solve that next. That's pretty straightforward. That is for uh, steel reinforcing. That's just 29 KSI or 29 times 10 to the sixth PSI. And then lastly, for variables in the first equation, we need W and W is the width of our diaphragm depending on the direction we're analyzing. If we scroll back up here, we're going in that kind of north, south, page up, page down direction for our analysis, which means that this dimension right here is going to be our W and then this direction along here is going to be our L and W from previous videos is 120 feet. That hasn't changed, that's just the dimension of the building. So if you're kind of hazy here a little bit, uh, pause this, but don't click off of it because we need to appease the YouTube algorithm uh, and go open up the previous design videos where we're starting off this building and you'll get more in depth with, uh, with the structure if this is the first video you're jumping into. And L, is 256 feet. We now have everything to solve that first uh, deflection equation. So let's just plug all that in and get going. Now with everything plugged in, we get the following answer. 1.85 inches. But we're not done yet. That's just the first part of the equation. Let's move on. Next, shear deflection. Well, we specified a 3 8 inch panel, structural one, with 80 nails and three by framing. We need to hop over to the special design provisions for wind and seismic to find our G sub A. We see it listed in the variables and they tell us exactly where to go. So on our assumptions and from previous calculations when designing our diaphragm, we have a blocked condition and we said structural one, 80 nails, three eighths inch ply, we have three by framing, and we have a four six scenario here, a four six. And there's that other row or the other column that's always been present here that maybe some of us haven't wrapped our heads around as to why we need that stuff. But that is for deflection criteria. Because again, kips per inch, that's, that's a stiffness. And if we run down that, that runs us right to here. We'll say we're using plywood. Um, of 6.5. And just like that, we have everything we need for this next portion of the equation. See, not so bad. 7.26 inches. Nicely done. I wanna stop briefly and some of you might be saying, hey, why are we being forced to use strength level forces versus service level forces? Like what, what mandates us to have to do that? Um, that's actually the 716. I'm gonna jump over to that section really quick just to show you where it is. So on page 103, you'll see in conjunction with this figure right here, where allowable stress design is used, delta shall be computed using the strength level seismic forces specified in section 12.8 without reduction for allowable stress design. So right there is where we have to, we are mandated to take those forces earlier that we designed using ASD, service level forces, for our wood diaphragm, and now need to transform them in up to strength level to run these calculations. Right there, 103, the 716, there you go. Okay, let's jump back and let's wrap up this diaphragm deflection. My shirt's on backwards. Smash the like button. Lastly, cord slip deflection. This one's gonna be easy because we're literally just bypassing it. And the reasoning is that our cord is rebar and for the rebar connections, you do not have to um, account for any slip of rebar. It doesn't happen. Maybe I'll try to find another example where we get more into cord slip. 
Um, something like if your cord was actually for a smaller wood diaphragm, you, you lay out and nail some strapping with blocking, that's where you'll, you'll experience some slip and some additional deflection um, associated with that. The sum of the deflections, 1.85 inches plus 7.26 inches plus zero inches, which gets 9.11 inches. We need to introduce C sub D, which is our deflection amplification factor, and that is dependent upon the lateral system that you are using in your structure. In this case, we have special reinforced concrete uh, shear walls all the way around the structure, and that's our lateral system. That has a C sub D equal to 5.0. This can be found in the ASCE 716, uh, chapter 12. Um, chapter 12, table 12.2-1. And we use this to find the total inelastic displacement of our diaphragm, which we do with this fun squiggly sub X. It's like a ladle, it's called a little ladle, big ladle. We know our importance is just 1.0 for this structure that was given previously in the problem. This is just kind of like a warehouse. And C sub D we found above equal to five. And ladle XE we just solved above, which is 9.11 inches. So we have everything, which gets us the following. 45.6 inches of total inelastic displacement. Now, we're going to use this next time to um, determine whether our diaphragm is truly flexible or if it's rigid based on the definition that the ASCE 716 gives. And that is determined, simply put, by comparing your uh, diaphragm deflection with your average story drift. So we're going to keep this information up in the head or in the back pocket. We're gonna bring it out next time and we're gonna go through that procedure to make sure that we confirm via the code that the analysis that we ran as a flexible diaphragm in our early calculations can hold true. We're gonna get into that next time. I hope everyone enjoyed today's example. I appreciate every single one of you here. The auditorium has been really ramping up, um, but there's always room for one more. So if you think you'd like to be that someone, subscribe down below. It's totally free. It means nothing, but it means a tremendous amount to me that you're here with us. So go learn something new. I hope today was that day and that this was that something that you learned. And until next time, see everybody later. Peace.